Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters, and we have Dr. Erlaine Bello on the, on the phone uh, on, on VMIX call, and we're talking to her about coronavirus. Hi, Dr. Bello. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, tell me about your specialties. Um, tell me about your training, and tell me about your involvement in coronavirus right now. Okay, so um, I'm an infectious disease and internal medicine doctor um, at the Queens Medical Center. So I see patients with a variety of infectious diseases. Um, I also am associate professor in the Department of Medicine at JABSUM. Uh, and I um, uh, work in the infection control program at the Queens Medical Center uh, also. So we are actively uh, in preparation at Queens um, to try to reduce the likelihood of people with uh, novel coronavirus um, transmitting their virus um, within our institution. Uh, we're fortunate so far we have not had any uh, either in the state uh, or at Queens. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we have to step in your shoes for a minute and um, see it from your point of view. You're at Queens Medical Center, and if somebody comes in on a plane, somebody, you know, has a temperature, uh, presents as a possible case, uh, there's a fair chance they're going to wind up in Queens Medical Center, am I right? And what happens then? Yeah, so we, we've actually had some patients who, who fit that profile um, come into our ER, and um, we've been proactive at uh, instituting what we call a travel screen. So patients who enter uh, through the emergency room or one of our affiliated clinics uh, are routinely now being asked about travel to China and specifically travel to Wuhan. Uh, if they have fever or other respiratory complaints, um, they are immediately masked and put into a room with a closed door um, bef um, until the first provider can evaluate them. And then our providers have been trained uh, that they enter those rooms with appropriate equipment, um, which includes a N95 mask, uh, as well as a gown. Um, they do their assessment and if they feel that the patient uh, could be somebody who has the novel uh, 2019 coronavirus, there's the immediate call to the Department of Health. Mm. Of course, in the meantime, they're also evaluated for the other respiratory viruses that are circulating right now, especially influenza. And maybe just pneumonia. Uh, or routine pneumonia. Oh yeah, routine viral pneumonias yeah, are also yeah. going around. You said uh, there was a special kind of mask. Can you talk more about the kind of mask that's effective as opposed to the kind of mask that's not effective? Yes. So I think there's a lot of confusion around the mask because there are different recommendations uh, from the CDC about what kind of mask who wears. So if a patient comes in, um, the, the first mask that's put on them is a surgical mask, so or uh, one that covers the, the mouth uh, and nose. And these are the same surgical masks that people wear in surgical procedures. Uh, but for providers um, who enter the room, uh, we're trying to actually protect them from getting the, this novel 19, a 2019 virus. So they actually have more enhanced mm -hmm. uh, isolation, uh, personal protective equipment. So this includes what we call an N95 mask uh, or the equivalent uh, and a isolation gown. Mm -hmm. So the patient's mask is intended to prevent spread um, of the virus in their respiratory droplet should they cough or sneeze. But the providers have an extra layer of basically the same kind of mask that we use for persons with TB, uh, where we see people with TB. Mm -hmm. 
I remember uh, reading that, um, you know, the, the Chinese uh, early on, early means uh, a week ago, um, had uh, isolated, uh, mapped the genome uh, for coronavirus and that, and that they had then shared it with the world. Uh, is this true? And uh, are there kits out there? And do you have kits by which you, make, you can make a, a confirmed diagnosis of uh, coronavirus? Yes, so definitely the, the genome, uh, the full genome for this coronavirus is available. Uh, and there are U.S. researchers actively trying to develop a vaccine. Um, so the diagnostic test of choice is what we call a PCR, which is, again, based on uh, piece, um, genome testing or components of the genome. So the Department of Health right now is the keeper of that test. Um, so our regular community microbiology labs uh, do not have access to that test. Mm. So if we have a patient that we suspect, again, we have to call the Department of Health directly uh, and they get involved in the collection of specimens and the testing. Mm. And the confirmatory testing at this point would probably go to the CDC. I imagine that both the masks, uh, N95 you mentioned, um, and the testing kit are going to be in short supply, uh, whether that's a, you know, a, a real short supply or, or just a, sort of a, a public concern short supply uh, going forward. And uh, are we, do we have sufficient kits? Do we have sufficient masks to deal with increase in, in the numbers of cases? So that actually was part of our preparation uh, for this, taking inventory of our availability of N95 masks for the providers, uh, as well as the surgical masks for you know, patients and um, our staff. And fortunately, again, we, we actually did this in advance of active planning for the novel coronavirus because we, we did the surgical mask inventory uh, in response to our efforts to contain influenza. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when, uh, when this, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So I, I you know, there's, there's been a lot of concern, I think on the part of the public um, because uh, I guess some of the local stores are out of surgical masks. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if it's still, if they're still available on Amazon, but, you know, there are other things besides just masking that, that one can do to protect oneself from the virus. I mean, there are some obvious things like not traveling to China, um, you know, not traveling on a plane if you don't need to. Yeah. When, when, the, um, when the virus was first uh, made public, uh, what I saw was uh, incubation of um, three or four days, but more recently, uh, uh, the word is the incubation is up to two weeks. Um, and more recently also, it, it, it seems that uh, we've had transmission um, among people in the U.S., uh, two people in the U.S. who have not been to China from people who have come from China. And then finally, the other revelation here um, is that you can, you can catch it from somebody who shows no symptoms, who doesn't present at all uh, in that, I guess, that 14-day incubation period. So my question to you, uh, Dr. Bellow, is this. You know, the, the whole defensive model is based on people coming from China, vectors from those people to other people here, and you track back from, you know, where the disease presents uh, to see whether there was a connection with somebody who came from China. But, you know, sometimes you don't know Sometimes in that 14-day period, it can jump from somebody who came from China to somebody who doesn't know, to somebody else who doesn't know. And I don't know how many levels it can go, but it can go to someone who has no idea about the vectors. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so that, that is the major public health challenge um, that I think everyone is dealing with right now. So. You're correct. Initially, um, it was thought that the trans, the incubation period. So the incubation period is a time between actual infection and the development of symptoms, where people with respiratory viruses may still be able to transmit the virus 
and the infection. Um, so it, it is difficult and, you know, there are, so, so I just read something today that um, Russia has actually closed its Chinese, you know, its border uh, with China. So I guess that's the extreme of, you know, what can, one can do um, in, in a country such as Russia is, is to actually close the borders um, and not allow anyone from China to come here. So I think most countries, uh, you know, have not taken that approach, but that would be one way to guarantee, you know, if you don't let people enter your country, um, then the likelihood of anybody transmitting the infection is, is low. But, you know, we, we don't live in that kind of society. Well, it just strikes me on a mathematical basis, and I think this is a good backdrop to understand about how this spreads or doesn't and how it ultimately burns itself out, um, is that if you have uh, people coming from China and uh, infecting other people, you're going to know pretty much within 14 days uh, or maybe a, a, a small multiple of that, uh, the, the extent of the damage, the extent of the spread. But if you close the border and you say no more people from China, nobody can come in, then you can do a mathematical calculation, can't you? And say that all this will be spent. It will, you know, the disease will burn itself out in X days because we will know, we will isolate and quarantine everybody who might be infected. And at the end of a certain period of time, there'll be no more infection possible. Am I right? Is this part of it? Yeah, so technically, but, you know, there's a lot of detail that we don't know about this virus yet. So again, the incubation period went from initially two to three days and, you know, a few weeks later to 14 days. Um, again, I think we, we don't know yet the, the real details about transmission. And even for, you know, SARS, MERS, you know, some of the information about vectors, about transmission, we really didn't confirm until years later. But that's one of the challenges of having acute outbreaks. You know, you have to do the best thing based on the information you know at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, for, for again, this constantly evolving disease, we, we, there's just so much we don't know. You say evolving, and that's an interesting term because uh, I saw something for the proposition that when coronavirus first hit the streets, so to speak, uh, it was a certain kind of virus. But then um, somebody said, wait, uh, it has mutated even in a short period of time. And that's coronavirus number two uh, and made, made worse by the mutation. And then I suppose, uh, like your thought on this, I suppose you could have mutation number three or four, uh, and it can, you know, keep us chasing because it keeps changing. Am I right? Yes. So, so again, all, all of this is speculation, um, but de definitely viruses can can mutate in varying time periods. Um, you know, one of the challenges with, say, HIV virus. I mean, that's been one of the challenges of HIV virus. Um, you know, the capacity to mutate over time. And again, we, we, we just don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and um, I, I'm sure what I'm saying is not inspiring confidence that we have this under control, but, it, you know, that it is what it is. Yeah. Oh, well, I think we all have to be realistic about it. Now, you had a bunch of slides, and I guess the overarching question is, what do we know about this virus and the way it spreads? Why don't you pick some of your slides and, and help uh, make people aware of uh, our current state of knowledge about this virus. All right, so maybe the first slide with that picture of the coronavirus. Yes, so this is just some basic um, virology. So the name coronavirus actually comes from the, the crown-like uh, appearance of those spikes, those protein spikes uh, coming out from the virus. And this is a RNA virus. Um, it can cause a range of disease in animals. And this, this is, again, important because it's thought that the current novel virus originally comes from animals. Mm -hmm. And if I can have the, the next slide here. 
Um, and this is just another picture, um, the structure. Again, you can see those crown-like appendages. Next slide. And this is also an interesting slide. So this actually came from my talk on the MERS uh, virus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. And you can see it's down there in the purple petal um, of this uh, sort of branching flower here. Uh, and then right next to it in the green is the SARS virus. Um, I actually um, don't have enough knowledge about the the phylogeny of the uh, novel 2019 to know whether it's going to fall um, up either in the purple or the green, or it's going to have an arm of its own. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And the coronaviruses uh, overall are found pretty much everywhere in the world. They tend to circulate in the winter in temperate climates. And they can cause up to 10% of acute respiratory infections in adults. Uh, it also is an important cause of uh, acute ear infections in children. And it's an infrequent cause of diarrhea in infants and children. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, in adults, um, you can actually isolate the virus in about 4% of people who present with an acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And typically it's a flu-like illness. Um, it can cause an acute exacerbation of people with chronic bronchitis, uh, pneumonia, and again, two of the previous important coronavirus are the SARS virus and the MERS virus. Okay, well, let me uh, let me ask. Um, you know, I remember that the SARS vi virus uh, struck something like eight thousand people, and eight hundred died. Of the eight hundred uh, who died, actually, it was more like five. five I think five thousand um, total, um, because um, there's just been some, yeah, some observations that the SARS count so far has exceeded the total number, uh, I mean, the novel 19 coronavirus numbers have so far exceeded the total um, SARS cases reported. And um, similar uh, with the Middle Eastern MERS virus, uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, it was, it was a, a pretty substantial percentage of fatality in there uh, by the time it spent itself. Um, and yes. in both cases, both SARS and, and MERS, um, health workers were a substantial percentage of the fatalities, yeah? Yes. Um, so a lot of those healthcare worker cases, I think um, you know, they, they had, definitely healthcare workers got it, but I think a lot of people were infected in those um, epidemics before people knew what they were dealing with. So they probably were not taking appropriate precautions. Um, the current recommendations for any coronavirus infection, um, including the current one, is that, again, healthcare workers use both airborne and contact precautions. So that's the N95 respirator and, and also wearing an isolation gown and gloves mm -hmm. and keeping mm -hmm. people, if possible, in negative air pressure rooms. Mm -hmm. So um, as for what the individual should do here or anywhere in the country, because I, you know, I think it's always a possibility these days, it's a, uh, it's a health emergency these days. Um, one is you would use uh, hand lotion sanitizer uh, often, and you'd wash your hands for more than 20 seconds, uh, and you keep doing that all day, and you wouldn't shake hands with anybody. You'd give them the elbow, maybe, but you wouldn't shake hands with them, and and you'd right. stay your you'd stay your distance away from them, from everybody, uh, to, to avoid the droplets getting on you. Am I right? Yeah. So if if I can have my uh, last slide. Um, I think it addresses a, a lot of those issues. So, you know, what, what can people do to protect themselves? And yes. we've already talked about not traveling to Wuhan, um, not traveling to China, 
um, avoiding unnecessary plane travel or even crowds where, again, you, can't, you don't know much about what the other person has. You can't control coughs or exposures. And then Jay alluded already to cough etiquette, you know, covering your mouth and nose area uh, with your, uh, when you cough or sneeze, uh, practicing frequent hand hygiene and either an alcohol sanitizer, hand sanitizer rub or actual hand washing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've tried to emphasize at Queens is, you know, if you, if you don't need to go to the hospital or a clinic, um, don't come. Um, and we discourage people who have fevers or symptoms of their own uh, from coming into the hospital, not just for novel 2019 coronavirus, but for influenza and other respiratory illnesses. Um, of course, if you have a patient um, who's dependent on you or um, a child, for instance, you, you have to accompany them to the healthcare setting. Again, take those other appropriate precautions. Mm. So suppose, um, suppose you know, a person, a given person is diagnosed. Um, I know that if you're elderly and you have respiratory issues in your life, you're at greater risk. Or if you're very young, you have greater risk. But, uh, in, and the fatality in SARS and the rate of fatality in SARS and MERS was both, what, over 10%. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but, uh, and we can expect something like that here now. It's already happening something like, like that now. What do you do? Okay. What are the chances of, of, of beating this if you get it? Well, the majority of people have survived, okay, but there, there are a percentage who have developed severe respiratory illness, and the specific term is um, ARDS or ARDS, where you have severe inflammation in the lung, um, and there are patients who have died from the novel 2019 coronavirus who have gone on to develop multi-organ failure. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of people have survived. Um, but in terms of the uh, demographic risk, um, certainly people who have underlying lung disease, diabetes, heart disease are at greater risk of uh, dying because they have, if they do develop a severe complication, um, they, they already have uh, some degree, uh, they may have some degree of organ compromise. But what is interesting um, so far, um, and I think I have a slide on the demographic of a series of 41 patients um, who were admitted to a hospital in Wuhan. Uh, and if you look at uh, the demographic, you'll see that actually, um, people in their 20s um, and uh, middle age were uh, affected just as much as the elderly. Mm, uh, and actually the number of people, the proportion of people um, ending up in intensive care units was actually quite similar uh, in all of the age groups. So remember, this is a novel virus so nobody in nobody has inherent immunity. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> just on the on the governmental side of this, um, this morning uh, I read that the World Health Organization had declared this a global medical emergency. I don't know what that means or what 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 they can, what they are funded to do, what they what steps they will take. At the same time, the CDC, the Centers for Disease uh, Control, uh, I guess that's in Atlanta, is it? Um, they, they have um, not declared it a national emergency. And for that reason, they have not released the, uh, the emergency money that they have, which they can release any time, uh, which is $85 million. I, I wonder, you know, what it is, what it, what it means to declare it an emergency, either by the World Health Organization or by the CDC, and why they're not on the same page. Okay, so I, I emphasize that I, I'm not an expert on the politics. So again, I, I'm just speculating here. Um, but early on, the CDC, uh, once there were cases outside of China, uh, were lobbying um, to have this declared a you know worldwide pandemic. 
Uh, and WHO actually only today uh, declared this an international public health emergency. But what this does for uh, WHO, um, as well as the CDC, uh, now that it's declared an international uh, public health emergency, actually allows them um, more latitude um, in intervening and going into China uh, to assess the situation mm -hmm. from their uh, points of view. So up until this point, um, you know, largely what we've been getting is what the Chinese government um, really allows um, to be uh, publicized outside of China. But this also, you know, gives, I think, um, China the, the chance to accept some assistance uh, in just um, public health assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it's a good thing. With regard yeah. to the CDC yeah. money, I think, you know, CD, in terms of U U.S. cases, and I do have a slide also of the U.S. cases, I think right now in the United States, I, I would not consider it a public health emergency either, mm -hmm. just based on the relatively small numbers of cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, as things evolve, this may change. Yeah. So this yeah. is um, the latest uh, data um, from January 29th. Uh, so you can see really it's four states that have been reporting cases. So Illinois, Washington, California, um, and Arizona. So these are confirmed cases. There are what they call PUIs or persons under investigation in larger numbers in all of those states. Mm -hmm. um, and I think notably um, for Hawaii, you, you could see that we, we have not had any cases, but I think we are a little nervous because we, we are the state that's closest to China. I've heard that, um, you know, some, some say, based on the experience with SARS and MERS, that, that this will is likely to burn itself out by May of this year, and that could be completely speculative. Uh, and I've also heard it said by Novartis, a drug manufacturer, a drug research company in Europe, I guess, uh, that it will take a year to develop a vaccine. Uh, but finally, I've, I've heard, I think, uh, that Johnson & Johnson is working on a vaccine right now and may be more optimistic than that. So, you know, where are we in terms of a burnout? Where are we in terms of the development of a vaccine? Yeah, so I don't think we're anywhere near burnout. I, I don't think we've seen the curve for cases peak yet. Um, and the vaccine, the vaccine is difficult. So once you know the genome, you can start work on the vaccine. But in the United States, vaccine development proceeds um, by very um, organized um, specific steps. So you have to go through phase one, phase two, phase three trials. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has the capacity to fast track drugs, um, including vaccines. Um, so I think, again, a, a lot of this is a moving target. Um, and, and to say that, you know, by May, we're going to have burnout, I, I think is um, very difficult to predict at this point in time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bellow, Dr. Erlaine Bellow at Queens Hospital. Thank you so much for sharing all this and, and helping us educate ourselves on what is happening and likely to happen. Thank you so much. Aloha. All right. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me.